Hello, welcome back to chapter 17 about the periodic chart. Uh, we are in the next section where we're going to be continuing to talk about the sections and regions of the periodic chart. If you remember yesterday, we looked at the periodic chart and saw there are lots of different regions and areas of the periodic chart. And we specifically talked about group 1A, which are referred to as the alkyl metals. If you'll remember, the numbers up at the top of the A's refer to how only valent electrons the elements have. So groups 1A, remember, just means that they have one valence electron. And group 2A are, uh, we have the two uh, valence electrons, remember, are the electrons are found on the outer level of the, peer, of the uh, atom. Okay, today we are going to talk about group 2A to start. And these are referred to as the alkaline earth metals. Uh, be aware not to confuse the names between the alkali metals and the alkaline earth metals. They're very similar names. Okay, group A, 2A, as would be stated, simply has two valence electrons. And we can tell again by the 2A at the top. Okay, the Electrons only have two of them instead of these eight that they want and are still very highly reactive. But not they're gonna be as reactive as group one, A, which you'll see. Okay, going through some of the elements in group two A, the first one we're gonna talk about is beryllium. This is a video that shows the process of getting beryllium from the ground and turning it into a usable form. Um, beryllium is generally added to other metals to make alloys, which are just mixtures of metals because beryllium will make other metals much, much stronger than they would be of other ways. There's a lot to consider when you're designing mirrors for a space telescope. They need to be lightweight, sturdy, and not change shape so much just because it's a little cold, like 400 degrees below zero. Glass won't do the trick like it does here on Earth, but beryllium will. So where do you find this rare metal? The West Desert of Utah, of course. Hey, so Rob, where are we going? We're headed to our current active open pit beryllium mine. This mine is, is the only mine like this in the entire world. So these are the only beryllium miners that you'll find. We are currently standing on uh, the edge of our active pit mm -hmm. where the hard rock is being excavated that covers the beryllium ore. So why is beryllium so valuable? It is it, very strong mm -hmm. and very light. It's a third the weight of aluminum mm -hmm. and has a six times the stiffness of steel. How tough is it to find beryllium? It took us about 30 years to gather all the data and information to design and develop this mine. And once the ore leaves this mine, is it ready for the folks at the James Webb Space Telescope program to use it to build the mirrors? No, after the ore material leaves the mine, it is shipped to the processing plant about 50 miles east of here. Well, great. Well, thank you so much for welcoming us and letting us see your beryllium mine. You're very welcome. So, Phil, we just came from the beryllium mine, and Rob told us that you guys take the ore that they over there dig up. Yes, that's right. The ore is hauled in and put up in these pockets here. And then we crush that ore and mix it with water to start the process. All right, so Phil, we just came from the ore, and you said they crush it, and then what? Well, this is the ore, what we get from the mine, mm -hmm. and then we crush it to a very fine slurry, and then after we leach it, we have the beryllium in the water, and the bottom has most of the beryllium leached out of it. What's happening here is that the 
slurry from the leaching area is brought out here through a pipeline and it goes into this well where it's mixed with a flocculant. What's a flocculant? It ties up the fine particles with the big particles so they will settle to the bottom. Okay. And then the clear overflow becomes the solution that we process to get the beryllium out of. This is a solution that we just came from those big tanks out there. And that'll be filtered to remove those fine particles. And then we mix that solution with the organic layer and the beryllium goes into the organic layer and most of the impurities stay in the water layer. Now you said organic layer. What, what does that mean to the rest of us? It's like oil and vinegar. Uh -huh. This is the oil in your oil and vinegar. So you're putting oil in or you're putting vinegar in? Yes. Uh, both. <laughs> both. Okay. The, the vinegar would be the water solution and we have a special extractant in the oil layer. Okay. So it flows to the top and we can concentrate and purify the beryllium. It's still a liquid here. What then happens? We purify it and, and precipitate it into a, a powder, which we then package. Beryllium dust is not exactly the best thing to be near, but can we see something that resembles a powder? Uh, yes, I have some uh, sodium carbonate right here, which is very similar to the texture and the fluffiness of our powder if it was dry. It looks kind of like a talcum powder, really. But very much so. Okay. These are the drums that we have our material in, ready for shipment. And you said shipment. Where are they going to go to next? Uh, these will probably go to Elmore, Ohio. Elmore, Ohio has what? Elmore, Ohio is the plant Russia Elmore owns that converts it into finished goods. So it's going to come out looking like a metal? Yes, it'll come out as a metal, an alloy, or an oxide. Great. Well, thanks so much for showing us your plant. You're certainly welcome. Well, you can find beryllium mixed with metals in everyday life, like computers, cell phones, and even your car, you can only find pure beryllium in specialized items like x-ray machines, space satellites, and now the James Webb Space Telescope. Thanks for joining us for this edition of Behind the Web. Okay, uh, the next element to talk about would be magnesium. Uh, this is one that you can have sitting in the room. We actually have some in the science classroom. Uh, it is a very lightweight and yet strong metal. A lot of high-tech things are made out of these. Uh, magnesium will obviously make airplanes which are lightweight, the internal parts cameras, and they are making high-end cars out of magnesium. Um, when talking about magnesium, this would be something that I would have done in a classroom. Uh, maybe for the there's time when you guys come back, you can wrap your mind and we can do this face-to-face. Uh, you do not need oh, this to work for this, if you can tell by the way you are excited, or you can see this at nice and you will be on fire. Um, it's if a metal, not, uh, but it's very soft, just tear a piece of it off. This is a metal that um, and it's also itself extremely will burn because it's so light. reactive. Yeah. I'm going to light this torch now that the lights are out. The torch gets to several hundreds of degrees Celsius. There we go. When I burn the magnesium, it gets to several thousands of degrees. Take a picture. Several thousand degrees, I should say. And it gets very bright. Do not look at it directly. It's like a flash bulb. Now you can see that it lights up the entire room. Okay. And I'm not looking at it because I don't want to burn out my eyes. Magnesium metal actually used to be used in powdered form uh, as a flash material. Uh, in the old days of photography, before the 1900s and uh, the advent of the electric flash, you used powdered magnesium as a flash material. You've never seen those guys holding a pole, you know, in old-time movies and stuff, and it goes poof. It's magnesium, and it makes that extremely bright white light, and it makes it for it makes it bright enough to actually make a photograph. Can you those guys that shoot up in the air and it makes that big flare? Yep, the flare. These magnesium is used in flares as well.
Okay, so the magnesium is usually used either for building very strong things that are lightweight. It also can be used to make bright lights, like it was used previously to make flashes, or currently to make flares. Now, some of the other ones you might have heard of calcium. I'm guessing you have heard of or related to the foods that you eat to give you those wonderful healthy teeth and bones. However, what you might not be aware of is calcium is also used in order to make bricks and in order to make concrete. Uh, calcium allows the things to become very hard like it in your teeth and bones. Strontium, although you probably haven't heard of it, is what makes the most beautiful bright red fireworks that you get to watch. And radium, although it is not generally used anymore, uh, used to be what would be on watches and different items to make them glow in the dark. They did discover that radium it actually was radioactive, so they decided it probably would be best not to use it on things that people wear. Like, so, all of the th things that are daily use, radium's been replaced with other things. Although radium is still used sometimes in the medical field. So, Okay, the next group actually is a large group called transition metals. This covers all the way from 1B all the way to 8B. Uh, if you look carefully, you will notice they are not in chronological or, or numerical or I guess. Um, there are reasons for them not to trust me. You don't need to know them. Just realize that they are that right way. Now, the B does not relate to the number of valence electrons. So, for the transition metals, that system breaks down. For the A's, it'll tell you valence electrons. For the B's, it's just a way of identifying the column. Okay, okay. Now, if you have not realized it from name, all of these substances are metals, and you have heard of a lot of them. So, um, first off, you have gold, which besides being pretty and used in jewelry or for coins, is usually used in computers on the motherboards to complete circuits. So when you look at that motherboard, you see that little tiny gold-colored dot or line. And those actually are, are real gold. There are some people in this world that they will and collect all the dead computers and see that they're melting gold off. Uh, uh, good luck if you want to do that to get at your 10 cents at a time. There is not a lot you used. Now, silver, which you've also heard of, is also used in computers. This is actually used as a solder, or kind of like a glue, for the different circuits, because silver is also a very good conductor of electricity, just like gold. One that you've probably heard of related to thermometers is mercury. However, you may realize that mercury is actually was in a lot of fluorescent bulbs. Uh, there is a lot of controversy over this because the idea of fluorescent bulbs was that it was better for the, the environment because you didn't use much of electricity. The problem is, is usually when bulbs go out, they end up going the trash and getting broken, and mercury is actually toxic to pretty much every living thing. And it doesn't come out of the body, it just stays there indefinitely. It builds up, and it causes all kinds of problems over the time. So, so there is a question about its environmental impact. Uh, there are others in there like iron, nickel, zinc, zinc, copper, a lot of things that you've heard of. You have chromium, which is obviously by its name, chrome. 
you do have a lot of weird things that you've never heard of before, like Osmium and Indium, um, and all kinds of weird names. Uh, but just realize that they have a lot of different uses. They are more stable. You can find gold and silver that are not combined with other things in nature. You can find just 